Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar series, The More They Know, How Building Knowledge Powers Reading Success. My name is Lauren Brenner, and I'm on the literacy team here at Amplify. We are so excited to have you here for the final webinar in our series, Constructing Comprehension, the Contribution of Background Knowledge with Nancy Hennessy. Before I hand the mic over to our incredible presenter, I have a few housekeeping items to cover. Today's webinar will be recorded and we'll email out the recording link for you to watch as you'd like. Everyone here with us today will also receive a certificate of attendance via email. Throughout the webinar, please drop any questions you have in the Q&A box, and if time allows, we'll answer some of the questions at the end. We encourage you to use the chat feature to converse with all the educators that have joined us today. So let's test it out. Let us know in the chat where you're joining us from, what your role in education is, and let's also share one win that you've had this week. I'm joining today from right outside of Philadelphia in Pennsylvania. The principal, Arizona, literacy specialists, Georgia, some elementary school teachers, DC, New Jersey, I'm, also, I'm from New Jersey. We have a few fellow colleagues on the line also from New Jersey, Maine. And let's see some of those wins as well that we've had this week as we reflect on the week. Baltimore. Well, it seems like we have a great group of educators today from all across the world and all different roles in the classroom. And we're so excited to have you here with us today. We recently launched season eight of Science of Reading, the podcast. This season, we're talking all about knowledge, why it's so critical for literacy development and student success, and how it can be built most effectively. Plus, we're also celebrating 5 million downloads. So keep your eye out for some celebrations up ahead. And thank you to all of our listeners for joining us on this incredible journey. If you haven't listened yet, subscribe today. We'll drop the link in the chat. Thank you again for joining us here today. We're so excited to have you. And we are so beyond lucky to have Nancy Hennessy with us to present Constructing Comprehension, the Contribution of Background Knowledge. Nancy is an experienced teacher and administrator who currently works as a literacy consultant. While in public schools, she provided leadership for innovative programming for special needs students and professional development for educators. She has designed and delivered keynote addresses and multiple virtual and live professional learning events, including workshops, podcasts, and training courses on dyslexia, science of reading, and structured literacy. Most recently, Reading comprehension has been her focus. Nancy is the author of the book, The Reading Comprehension Blueprint, Helping Students Make Meaning of Text. A companion book, The Blueprint Activity Book, will be published in early 2024. So be on the lookout for that. She has also written the chapter, Working with Word Meaning, Vocabulary Instruction, and Multisensory Teaching of Basic Skills, the fourth edition. While serving as a national trainer for language essentials for teachers of reading and spelling, she co-authored letters, Digging for Meaning, Teaching Text Comprehension, Second Edition with Louisa Moat. She is the past president of the International Dyslexia Association. In 2011, Nancy received IDA's Margaret Bird Rawson Lifetime Achievement Award and was recently honored with the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction 2023 Impact Award. What a wonderful array of accomplishments. And now without further ado, it's my honor to hand the mic over to Nancy. Welcome, Nancy. We're so excited to have you here with us today. Thank you so much, Lauren. All right. Just give me a moment and I'll get my slides up and we'll be ready to go. All right, hopefully you can all see these now. Yes, Lauren. Looks great. All right, perfect. Wow. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining me today. I'm excited to be with you with fellow Learnivores. Um, while I've had many, many opportunities in education, I continue to think of myself as an educator uh, working now with colleagues um, on the science of reading, thinking through how we can best serve all of the children that are in our schools, regardless of the role that we have. So, of course, today, um, I have this wonderful opportunity because of Amplify to talk to you about constructing comprehension, 
the contributions of background knowledge. And what I want to do over the course of the next hour is speak to you, first of all, about comprehension itself, to think a little bit about what we mean by knowledge, and then to dig deeply into background knowledge itself. So I'm going to invite you to surface what it is that you know and to think about um, how this connects to current practice and how this might change or help you elaborate on current practices so that, again, all of our students can succeed. I like to begin with this particular thought, the ultimate goal of reading. I know we want all of our students to become proficient and skilled readers, but I want you to think a little more deeply about this and we'll return to this at the end of the webinar. I want you to think about why is it so important that our students become skilled and proficient readers? As we think about skilled reading, of course, reading comprehension comes to mind. And while there are many different ways that we can define or describe reading comprehension, I'm sure as I'm talking, some of you are beginning to think about extracting and constructing meaning, making meaning, perhaps you're thinking about some of the skills that are necessary. I want to be certain that you also think about the fact that reading comprehension is quite complex. UCATS in the not so long ago article in an AFT publication spoke to the fact that reading comprehension is not a single skill. And I think that's really critical for all of us to be thinking about. It's not something that one learns and then can apply in different reading situations because, all right, it's not a single skill. It is made up of multiple skills and knowledge. In fact, it is quite complex. He says to us that it's one of the most complex behaviors that we engage in on a regular basis. Others have spoken to the fact that while we may be proficient readers and it feels effortless, the reality is it is not. So I want you to be paying attention to the fact that he's made the point here in that very last part of this description. That reading comprehension is dependent upon a wide range of skills and knowledge. And so we should begin to be thinking about what did he mean by this? How can we begin to surface what is specifically meant by knowledge? So again, I'm going to ask you to bring forward to surface what comes to mind when you see this word knowledge. You know, what's the semantic network that you activate? Uh, what terms come to mind? How would you describe knowledge? And recently I heard two individuals speak to this who have written an article on what knowledge actually is. And this is the way in which they defined knowledge. Knowledge is complex. All right, just like comprehension. N indicates the sum, and I think that's an important word, the sum of what an individual or a group knows. So this is the work of Hatton and Lupo. So we need, first of all, to think of knowledge in a very broad-based way, right? Being all that we carry with us based on our learning, our experiences, and so on. But then I think we need to ask the question, well, if it's so broad, right? What types of knowledge are specific to reading comprehension? And again, these two individuals have identified for us various types of knowledge that play into our ability to make meaning of text. Linguistic knowledge, for instance. Think about all the language systems that are necessary in order for us to come to a text and read a text. Think about semantics, syntax, discourse structure, and so on. They also spoke to the fact that content or topic knowledge is particularly important. And in fact, that's our focus for today. We'll be talking about the specific knowledge that relates to the specific topics that we are reading or listening to. Right? We also can talk about conceptual knowledge. And when we think about the goal of comprehension, the goal really is learning the acquisition of knowledge. What are the concepts and ideas the big ideas, the critical understandings that we take away. These three I've bolded because these are the three that I'll specifically be addressing um, with a focus on background knowledge today. But it's also important to recognize that we need a knowledge of text structure. And sometimes um, teachers who are working with me are surprised when I say text structure is a specialized type of background knowledge. 
knowing how texts are structured, understanding how to use multimodal approaches to text, um, really understanding the nuance of text is particularly important. We can also talk about strategic knowledge. And yes, strategies are tools that we want our students to acquire so that they can make meaning of text, particularly when they are struggling to make their way through that text. Hopefully those strategies become skills over time. And then we cannot forget about cultural knowledge. We cannot forget about the fact that the student needs to be able to see themselves in the text. So culture in a very broad way, um, influencing what it is that the student's able to do in terms of making meaning. So this is a broad-based approach then to thinking about, first of all, knowledge, and then knowledge that affects reading comprehension. So we're drilling down here, we're beginning with a broader view and then drilling down in terms of the importance of background knowledge. Last but not least here, conditional knowledge. And this has everything to do with the fact that when a student comes to text and that they're struggling with perhaps the meaning of the text, they recognize that because they're monitoring their comprehension, right? They're monitoring the conditions under which learning is occurring for them, and then they're doing something about that, right? Now, I'm very attuned with, and I'm sure all of you are, with the science of reading and the reality that our research uh, models, our theoretical mo models, provide direction for us in terms of how we go about developing skilled reading. And what I wanted to do was to share a model that I'm sure many, if not all of you, are very familiar with, and that's the simple view of reading. How is it that we arrive at reading comprehension? Well, what Goff and Tummer told us a number of years ago, and they recognized it wasn't quite so simple, but they synthesized or summarized this for us by presenting two factors, decoding or word recognition and linguistic, or sometimes called language comprehension, and how both of those factors are necessary in order to arrive at reading comprehension. More recently, Hoover and Tummer have elaborated on that view and in doing so, they help us make connections to this idea that knowledge is so critical. When we take a look at the elaboration, we see both of these factors represented. We see decoding or word recognition, we see language comprehension, but they further break down this linguistic knowledge, right, that is necessary. So again, we begin to see these systems of language that are playing in phonological, syntactic, semantic knowledge, and they also acknowledge the importance of background knowledge and inferencing skills. So once again, I would say to you that important that as we begin to think about background knowledge specifically, that we build our understanding, that we begin with the big idea, right? And then we begin to think about these varied subtypes or ways of thinking about knowledge that contribute to reading comprehension. Walter Kinch is well known in the field of comprehension for his construction integration theory. Um, this ability of the reader to come to task to construct and integrate meaning throughout so that they arrive at something called a mental model. And we're going to talk more about that mental model in a moment. But I think this is a particularly important quote um, from Walter Kinch's work. And I'm going to ask for you to take a look at this with me. And as I read this to you, I'm going to ask that you also be thinking about um, reading it to yourself or perhaps aloud, <laughs> um, but at least read aloud, but read along. So a writer must always rely on the reader's knowledge to some degree. There is no text comprehension that does not require the reader to apply lexical, syntactic, semantic knowledge, domain knowledge, personal experience, and so on. So all readers are using this vast fund of knowledge, including what we've just addressed. And when we take a look at this, he's really speaking to knowledge of word, lexical, knowledge of how sentences are structured, syntactic, semantic, the word meaning, phrase meaning that we need to deal with. And then of course, the domain knowledge, which in this case is the content-based knowledge, the background knowledge that's necessary to work with text as well as personal experience. So I like to then um, pull this together um, to think about how this actually applies to reading, right? 
Um, and from knowledge, we can begin to think about the skills that emerge from these different types of knowledge. We can begin to think about what it is that we need to address with our readers in order for them to work their way through text and construct meaning, right? So what goes on in the mind of the reader as they approach text, as they think about text? What are the skills? What, are, what is the knowledge base that's necessary for them um, to actually construct this meaning? So beginning with, what does this word, phrase, sentence mean? Now, again, acknowledging that our students are using their word recognition capabilities to work with the words within the text. If they cannot read by, by eye, then they need to be reading by ear. So we need to give them access to the print. So what does this word, phrase, sentence mean? Which who or what is this about? What's happening? Why, where, how, and when? So our students are moving from word meaning, all right, working with the meaning of the word, to figuring out the syntactic sense of the sentence. So they're using what type of knowledge, linguistic knowledge, vocabulary, their knowledge of vocabulary, and their knowledge of how sentences are constructed to convey meaning, sentence comprehension. We also need to be thinking about, you know, um, how ideas are integrated. So again, the reader thinking about how do these ideas connect, all right? Um, how do we integrate the meaning within and between um, these sentences? Are there some clue words that allow for us to be thinking about um, this? And how are the ideas then arranged in the hierarchy? So here our reader is tapping into the skills, the knowledge base, again, related to what? Related to sentence comprehension, so linguistic knowledge, but also they're tapping into that text structure knowledge as well. At the same time, and just note that the arrows are bi-directional, right? They need to be thinking about whether or not they're understanding. So do I understand what I'm reading? What else do I need to do? In other words, how do I fix up the fact that I don't understand the meaning of the word, or I don't understand the sentence, or I don't have the knowledge to connect to? What are some of the things that I need to be doing? So this is that comprehension monitoring, the conditional knowledge that I was speaking to. And then, all right, we know that as our readers read, we want them to go below the surface of the text. We want them to go beyond what it is that the te text has explicitly stated, that we want them to get to those implied meanings. So what do I know that connects to what I'm reading? How will that help me understand what the author meant but did not say? So here we have background knowledge that allows us to do what? It allows us to inference. And I'm going to keep saying this, um, as a reminder for all of us, you cannot make inferences if you do not have background knowledge. So it's absolutely critical to be able to make these connections. And then we think a little bit about kind of these um, mental model that I mentioned, kind of the understandings that we walk away with. What did the author want me to understand from reading this text? What are the big ideas, right? What am I taking away from the text? So not only what is the mental model, the understanding of this particular situation, this particular text that I can use in the future, but how does that add to my knowledge base in general, right? To the concepts, to the ideas that I carry forward with me. Now, just let me take a moment to explain mental model if in fact that's not something that you're familiar with um, because of the important role that these different types of knowledge, but particularly background knowledge plays in terms of mental model. As the reader walk, works their way through the text, as I just spoke to you about this, they use both language and cognitive processes to do what? To integrate these successive units of meaning at the surface and the text base. That means the exact words and also what's underlying the text. This is necessary for constructing this mental model. The mental representation of the text includes information explicitly stated as well as what's implicit in the text. What is the mental model? It's the reader's overall understanding of the situation. It's what they store in memory and hopefully access for the future. It is those concepts, those ideas, all right, that allow for us to come back to text and to elaborate on our understanding of text. As you're listening to me, you're elaborating on or you're affirming what was already in your mental model related to comprehension and the connections to knowledge. Well, finally, you must be saying, 
she arrived at background knowledge. So let's stop for a moment and let's think about what we've spoken to so far, right? We began by thinking a bit about this ultimate goal. We still haven't addressed that. And then we took a look at comprehension being complex and needing multiple skills and different types of knowledge in order for us to make meaning, in order for our students to make meaning. And we moved from that and talked about the different types of knowledge that the researchers, the experts, right, Hatton and Lupo in this case, have identified for us. And then thought about what does that actually mean in terms of the reader coming to text and how they begin to integrate all of these different ideas, right, success of units of meaning, and how they arrive then at an overall understanding or mental model of the text. So now let's drill down just a bit further and let's talk about background knowledge itself. Okay. So as we begin to think about this, um, I've already provided you with a description or definition. So I think you probably could um, easily script one, but let's just take a look for a moment here. All right. So this is the work of Brody all right, um, and colleagues. And what Brody and colleagues um, uh, who have followed um, in his work say to us is that background knowledge is what? Read with me, please. Background knowledge is specific to the situations, problems, and concepts presented in targeted text. Used in academic setting has been referred to as concepts, experiences, information, and text structures that are relevant to the text under study. So here we have a definition of background knowledge that calls attention to the fact that we are focusing on what is relevant to what it is that we are reading and learning about. So it's not this whole sum of, right? It is specific to the topic. It is specific to the theme that we're learning about. And interestingly enough, you may have noted here that Brody has included all right, the, the text structures. And I earlier said to you, Sometimes um, individuals are surprised when I say text structures are a part of background knowledge. But you know, when you're a proficient reader, you automatically access and bring flow with that text structure to help you understand the purpose, all right, and the organization of the text itself, all right. So we've talked about, again, um, the what and the why. So this is really the how, yeah, okay. So when we begin to think about the how of background knowledge and how it supports instruction, right, we can again turn to the work of you cats and be thinking a bit about this. That first of all, it's important because it provides a framework for what? Organizing the incoming information. It gives us a way of organizing up and holding on to information. It allows us to make inference, right? It allows us to go beyond what is explicitly stated in the text. And once again, I will say to you, I've said this many, many times in working with teachers, you can teach multiple strategies for inference, but if your students do not have, if the reader does not have background knowledge, they cannot make an inference. Inference is all about making connections between what you know and what the text has provided for you. It also is the most critical component of critical thinking, right? We can't think critically about something if we don't know anything about it. And last but not least, it allows us to make the most of our working memory. I think this is really important as we think about the fact that comprehension is so complex and we know about the, the necessity to have enough cognitive resource to deal with the complexity of text. This is one of the reasons we want word recognition to be automatic. And by the way, it's a reason why we want for these different linguistic processes, skills, knowledge, um, we want that to come automatically to our students as well, right? So just a little bit more about each of these, um, a few different ways to think about this. And I think um, as we consider this topic of knowledge, it's important that there's a history here that individuals have been talking about the importance of knowledge for a while it's become really, um, it's come to the forefront recently, but it isn't that we haven't had a history of individuals speaking to this. One of those individuals certainly has been Edie Hirsch, another Marilyn Adams, another Susan Newman, 
So I'm going to speak to a few of the things that they've provided for us up till now. Marilyn Adams, take a moment and read this to yourself. So mental top grow, all right, a place for things to stick. And this connects directly to what you cats has said to us about framework. How about imprints? This is Daniel Willingham. Many of you probably know his work as well. Take a moment and read this to yourself. Yes, the acknowledgement that language is full of semantic breaks in which what the author just assumes you're going to fill in the gaps, right? Right. That's what really this a particular type of inference known as global coherence inference is about. It's about gap filling. All right. So this ability then to fill in the gaps. And then this is an oldie but goodie, right? Um, this is uh, uh, the Knowledge Matters campaign, right? And this is again, Daniel Willingham. And um, if you haven't been to that site, you probably want to visit that site. It's chock full of resource information about curricula and so on. What I, I think is critical here is some of the takeaways here in terms of critical thinking, it's not a set of skills and strategies that can be directly taught, practiced, and applied to any topic. You need a deep knowledge in order to think creatively or critically about it. And there are no shortcuts to expert thinking. To think like a scientist, for instance, a student must know the facts, concepts, and procedures that a scientist knows. In other words, they need knowledge. All right, so just take a moment and consider how knowledge gets used then um, by students in order to um, stick, uh, have information stick to one another, in order to make inference, um, in order to think critically. If your students, and you can think about what your students are currently reading, if your students were reading Dear Benjamin Banneker, right? Um, a very interesting little book about an African-American male who lived during the time of Thomas Jefferson, was an astronomer, all right? Um, but he also spoke out against slavery. Right? He was, he wrote a letter to Thomas Jefferson. He was um, an activist. So if you're thinking about a big idea, this big idea of activism or revolutionaries, um, you might be reading about Dear Benjamin Banneker. And what would you need to know in order to understand him and his contributions? You would need to know what life was like for an African American male in that specific time period to appreciate all that he did and why he was an activist, right? If you were reading um, The Founding of an American Democracy, it comes from Common Lit, um, Benjamin Banneker, earlier grades, uh, Founding um, of an American Democracy, maybe sixth, seventh grade, you'd need some kind of historical perspective, um, including the colonists and the legislative leaders' perspectives in order to understand how we arrived at um, the varied documents, including the Articles of Confederation, Declaration of Independence. Um, what did that look like? Um, what influenced uh, the, uh, the scripting of those documents? All right. All right. So that was the beginning of the introduction to the how. Um, now let's really uh, dig deep and get into some of the instructional approaches. And this is what we always want to know about. I always begin with talking about the what, the why, and introduction to the how, because I think it's so critical that we understand why we do what we do. What is the basis for, what is the foundation upon which our informed instruction um, begins or um, is laid. All right. So again, I've turned to uh, the science, to the research, the experts, and here are some general instructional principles about the development of background knowledge. How do we go about making certain that our students have adequate background knowledge to make the connections that are necessary for them to comprehend, not just at surface level, but in a deep way? And this reflects um, the work of Susan Newman. Some of you may know her work. She's a professor at um, New York University. She's been very, very involved in um, the research around early childhood. Um, and she's a former uh, a, a assistant secretary of education. She um, does a great deal of research in the area of the development of language 
vocabulary and background knowledge necessary for our students to succeed. And then um, this also reflects the work of uh, Sonia Cabell, who is at Florida State University, who also um, has been speaking to this issue of what is necessary, how do we integrate um, uh, knowledge into uh, both our reading and our writing instruction so that our students can be successful, right? So let's just take a quick look at these. Um, and these are, again, our general principles based in the science. So we need to focus on skills and content. It's not enough to develop comprehension lessons that are solely focused on the development of vocabulary, um, uh, sentence comprehension, um, text structure, and so on. Those are types of knowledge, but we tend to think of those as literacy skills, all right? So we need to develop these literacy skills, word meaning, sentence meaning, and so on, as well as what? Content goals. So we need to be thinking about what is, our, is it that we want our students not only to be able to do in terms of working through the text, what do we want them to know? What are they taking away from the text? And in order to do that, we need to focus on big ideas, right? So we need to be identifying upfront um, through our curricula, through our programs, through our readings, all right, the critical understandings that we want our students to walk away with. In essence, those mental models the big ideas, right? And we can do that through the use of themed or topic units. We can do that through an integrated curriculum in which in our ELA curriculum, we're not just addressing um, English or narrative, um, but we're introducing informational texts that also look at science, social studies, content, right? We need to be using multiple genres to do this. And so our readings, or the books that we're choosing, the selections that we're choosing need to be very purposeful. So an example of this would be cohesive text sets, um, text sets that are integrating these different types of knowledge. In addition to that, we need to provide intentional opportunities for language engagement for our students. We need to be connecting both reading and writing. We need to give our students opportunity to process and build knowledge both through reading and writing, through discussion orally, and through written expression. And then it's not sufficient to visit a big idea just once, or even in an early grade. It's important to have cumulative review, and I'll show you an example of how to do that in a moment. And last but not least, here's something that sometimes is forgotten about, a focus on word knowledge, right? So word meaning is more than a definition, is it not? It's really reflective of our understanding of concept, right? And so we need to be thinking about building, building a knowledge of word meaning that's conceptually and thematically related to some of these big ideas that we're working with. So again, these are general instructional principles that can underlie, that can provide us with um, a way of thinking about background knowledge, the connection to background knowledge, um, the activation, the building, and the connecting uh, to what it is that we're reading. So um, one of the things that I've done is thought a great deal about this. And um, Lauren was kind enough to mention uh, that I have uh, scripted a blueprint for reading comprehension. And this actually is the blueprint itself. Um, it's a framework. It provides a framework for us to think about how do we develop these different types of knowledge? How do we develop the varied skills that our students need in order to work with complex text? This is not a lesson plan, it's a master plan. It's a guide and it provides a way of scaffolding and structuring instruction. What I wanted to show you in this particular blueprint, and by the way, not perfect in any means, all right? Nothing's ever cast in concrete. Our science continues to evolve. But it does include what? An opportunity for us as educators, as we're beginning to think about comprehension, as we're preparing for instruction, to think about critical understandings, to think about our purpose for reading. So my, my sense, based on the science, based on the experiences, this is our starting point. What do we want our students to know and understand? What big ideas do we want them to acquire? What text will support that? What are the content instructional goals and objectives? What are the literacy instructional goals and objectives? 
And here's an example of how one might think about this. In terms of literacy goals, I tend to think about what do I need to do to construct the comprehension house? This is my comprehension house, right? And of course, foundational, critical understandings, what it is that we're going to learn, right? But in order to learn, what do we have to be able to do? And you see here, major support beams, major pillars, vocabulary and background knowledge. But we've not forgotten about sentence comprehension. We've not forgotten about text structures. We've not forgotten about this beam that runs across <laughs> this framework that our students need to be able to answer questions and work with questions and demonstrate understanding at different levels of understanding, including that mental model. That's how we arrive at reading comprehension. At the same time, all right, what are we doing? We're building their knowledge. We're thinking about critical understandings, essential questions, big ideas, whatever it is that you call this, all right? And what are some examples of this? Well, you might be thinking about personal identity across time. We might be thinking about change is inevitable and it's positive and negative. We might be thinking about multiple causes for conflict and so on. Or these could be topics or more specific themes than what are represented here. What you need to walk away from with this and be thinking about, and you may already be doing this, is again, what is it that we want our students to learn? All right. So focusing on both literacy goals and on content goals. And here's just an example for personal identity. All right. And earlier I mentioned that um, one of the general guidelines is that we should be cumulative in terms of developing themes or topics. Here's an example for little ones using Leo the late bloomer, all about me, personal identity. And there's multiple questions that we might raise that go along with this, right? And again, in eighth grade, we might be revisiting this, who am I? And we can see how we evolve in terms of thinking about our identities from I am unique, there is no one else like me, to individual identities are complex and they show themselves in many ways. And here the reading would be Persiopolis, for instance, just an example of one text for each of the grade levels. Sometimes we're using multiple texts, right? We also need to be thinking about these purposeful texts that I mentioned. So again, one of those general guidelines, purposeful texts, what we read, what our students read matters. Take a moment and reflect on these questions and see how you might respond to these as you think about what it is that your students are currently reading. All right, I want to point out to you the importance of, um, well, they're all important, but do your readings represent different genre disciplines, the interests and experiences of your readers? Are they culturally responsive? Really critical that we value the perspectives that our students bring, that our students can see themselves in the text that we're providing for them as we develop these big ideas. All right. So before we move on, and before I give you more specific examples for building background knowledge, moving from general to more specific, um, I've not talked so much about um, or provided the examples for um, intentional opportunities or focus on word building, but I didn't want to leave this without at least coming back and saying, in this limited amount of time, I could provide some examples, but don't forget about these two. So then moving on, all right, moving on from preparing for instruction, this focus on content, all right, and literacy skills, the use of purposeful readings, all right, let's be thinking now about the skills and processes, the knowledge that's necessary, um, that's in the service of learning, in the service of reading, and of course our focus again, background knowledge. So here's the question that I asked in the blueprint. Um, what background knowledge is critical to understanding text, how and when we would teach students to access and build their knowledge and integrate it with text? A little bit more specific, you might ask yourself these questions again, read with me. What's necessary for understanding the critical topics and understandings represented in the text? What did the author assume readers would bring to the text? How will I activate or gain access to my students' knowledge? Given what my students know, what else might my students need to know? 
how I facilitate the building of necessary knowledge, how I prompt integration of background knowledge with text. How often or not do you consider these planning questions? All right. So from that, from that thinking, from using those questions as guidance, all right, we can identify what I've called the ABCs of background knowledge. So now we're going to do some specific examples. So how might we activate and assess background knowledge? Well, here's a few examples, and perhaps you would be adding to this list. We can use anticipation guides, questions and prompts, charts, webs, maps, visual images. How might we build background knowledge? Oh, through multiple topical themed text. I think I talked about that. Virtual and real-time experiences, authentic artifacts, visual images, vocabulary connections. And then let's not forget about connecting and integrating so that we can make inference. Some of these we return back to um, in a progressive way um, and use the same things that we used in those other two columns, anticipation guides, questions, charts, applications to other readings, text sets, All right? So now I'm doing, in the remaining time, I'm going to share with you just a few examples and these are things that you probably have in your toolbox. So do a nice check off for yourself if you're already using some of these. Um, hopefully I'll give you some additional ideas um, for other things you can use as well. So if we're working at activating and assessing, and by the way, I wanna call attention to the word assess, because when we activate, what are we really doing? We're looking at what is it that our students are bringing or not. And that then gives us some sense of what else we need to do. But here's an anticipation guide. And to anticip anticipation guides reflect the content that our students are reading. Um, this one is based on um, a book that connects to All About Me, all right? It's a book about the family, all right? And what has happened here is we've pulled some statements. Um, a family often includes children and the grown-ups who care for them. Families are a loving community. There are different ways to be a family. Family members have the same roles and responsibilities. And we're, what are we asking our students? Now, this is tends to be a read aloud, but if not, all right, so we'd be talking with them about this, but if not, they could be provided with a written copy and they're asked, do you agree or disagree? Or is this a yes or a no? Or is this true or false, all right? So it's activating and assessing one way that we can do this. And it connects to that big understanding or a critical understanding in one of the questions, you know, I am a part of a family in a classroom community, all right? Another way that we can activate and assess is we can use varied questions with our students. And so here what we see are some questions that might be used individually or in combination, right? And they're general as well as specific to different types of text. So what do you already know, you know, about this topic, about this enduring understanding, about this idea? What experiences have you had related to? Um, but if in fact, you know, we're talking about a personal narrative or perhaps a narrative involving setting, what do you think it would be like to live in this particular setting at this time? Do you know what it is like to be? And we could be talking about character motivation, connections to other readings. Do you remember reading or learning about Based on what you know, what do you think this? So here we have a prediction. What type of text is this? Have I seen this type of text before? So using text structure as part of our background knowledge. So varied questions dependent upon what it is our students are reading, what our focus is. Of course, you know this one, right? Who doesn't know a KWL? And there are lots and lots of different variations on KWLs that we can use. So here we have, what do you know? What do you... You know, what is it that you want to know? But we have, how will you find out is added here? And we'll talk about that in a moment because that's the building, right? So this is progressive. So what do you already know about the Columbian Exchange? So this has everything to do with the big idea might be the age of exploration, right? And thinking about Columbus and how the varied um, uh, explorations that he and others um, engaged in, um, then influence the new world. So the Columbian Exchange, you might know it's an in depth to Columbus. It happened during the age of exploration. Explorers came in boats. What do you want to know? What was the purpose? Why was he credited with discovering America, right? And then how will you find out? We'll get to that in a moment, right? 
We also can then switch gears a little bit and talk again about building um, knowledge base. And we talked about purposeful readings, right? And I gave you an example of um, Leo the Late Bloomer and Persepolis. But if in fact we were focused on personal identity or some other topic or theme, all right, um, we might be thinking about the use of more than one, more than one text or different types of text. And this is an extensive list. <laughs> um, so um, it's really a resource list that one might choose some text from. But again, giving you the sense that we want multiple perspectives. And again, we want the students to see themselves in these texts, all right? How else can we build? Well, we can build through authentic artifacts and visual images. So let's return to that theme or that topic of activism or a revolutionary, and we might be reading about Rosa Parks. Or maybe this is a little bit beyond when we read about Dear Benjamin Benninger. And we want to do what? We want to build knowledge so we can surface and then build on based on what do we know about this picture? What's this picture telling us, all right? And bringing forward what was happening at this particular time period and why did this happen to Rosa Parks? So we have her fingerprints, we have her arrest record, and we have a visual image that we can use. By the way, National Archives, National Library of Congress, wonderful for the use of these images, all right? We also can use real-time experiences for building so here's an example from a school that I've consulted with and um, worked at for a while, um, in which students engage in something called an, active, an interactive humanities class from first grade on. And each of those years um, that they're in interactive humanities, right, they're focused on what? They're focused on varied time periods, right? And they experience the time period. They come together, right? in the Renaissance time period, they become the great thinkers, they become Galileo, they become da Vinci, they become Michelangelo, right? They become part of a guild, they learn what a guild is, right? They learn about not only the history, the culture, the art, and so on of the time as they become these individuals. And the setting in which they are, all right, reflects artifacts from that particular time period and the vocabulary of the time period becomes the password for entering the classroom each day, right? We also can continue to build through authentic artifacts and visual images. And so if we're reading about or studying about suffrage or equal rights, right, or civil rights um, uh, under that umbrella, we can begin to talk about what happened early on for women um, as they protested um, long ago for what the right to vote. And we combine this then with questions. So we don't use this in isolation. We could have combined uh, the slide before the Rosa Parks slides with questions as well. And I'm returning, all right, uh, back to where I began, um, to the KWL, thinking a little bit now, how will you find out? So how do we build, all right? Well, we, we can build using varied combinations, a search on the internet, go to the school library, review resources like my textbook, and so on. You know, when I talked about comprehension monitoring earlier, I think comprehension monitoring um, needs to be specific to where the speed bump or the hurdle is. And so I would teach my students to be asking themselves, what is it I don't understand? Is it a vocabulary word? Well, if it's a vocabulary word, I need to go to my independent word learning strategies, use of context morphology. Is it a problem with the sentences? Well, then what I need to do is ask myself, who or what is this sentence all about, right? Is it a problem with background knowledge? Well, where else can I go to get the information? And this is just an example of that. Okay. Again, um, for connections, I can, build, I can now return to something that I've used before. I can return to my anticipation guide. And instead of asking before reading, agree or disagree, now I can ask after reading, agree or disagree. So as we think about all of this, I need for us to be thinking about the fact that we can use the ABCs as a way of thinking through, um, you know, what it is that we need to know about and how we go about then making connections after we've thought about, um, after we thought about 
activating, assessing, building, and connecting. So here's the chart once again. So I'd ask you to do this. I want you to think for a moment about what is it that you do um, in your setting? What do you do with your students, whether you're working individually, small group, whole group, in order to activate? What might you add to the first column? What might you add to the second column? What might you add to the third column? In what ways are you supporting your students' ability to work with text, to gain knowledge from text by making connections to text? Because of course that last column is the most important column in terms of the use of what it is that we actually know. All right, now I'd be remiss if I didn't say to you, we all work in different contexts. We work with different students. Our students come with varied um, uh, knowledge sources. Um, and so we need to always be thinking about how we differentiate, how we adapt for our students. So I'm going to give you a moment to read some thoughts that I have on this topic. Right, so I want to say to you, when we think about students with learning difference, all right, um, students with learning disabilities, oftentimes they will have the knowledge that is needed, but they don't access the knowledge. And so it's important as we think about their ability to make inference, for instance, making that connection, the integration of knowledge, that we provide them with scaffolds, all right? And a very nice scaffold that comes out of research, um, research that was done by Elbro and colleagues, um, in which they ask students to use a graphic organizer and call attention to the fact that this is what this is what the text says. All right. And so providing a question, all right, and then asking them to look at exactly what the text says about that particular question, all right, and then asking them. What do you know about this particular topic or this particular sentence or this particular passage, all right, from the text? Therefore, what do you think? And sometimes just that kind of prompt or scaffold will allow for the student to bring forward the knowledge base that they have, all right? Secondly, I think it's really important that um, we think about what it is that our students who are coming from different backgrounds bring into the classroom and that we value the different experiences that they've had, the different cultural experiences, right? And that we try to make connections to, um, we try to surface for them so that they're able to then get that Velcro up that allows for them to better understand what it is that you're talking about, right? So I'm coming back to this ultimate goal of reading, all right? And I like to sum up by saying, I'm hoping what you're taking away from this is, first of all, that when we think about comprehension, we have to think about its complexity. That secondly, we need to understand that knowledge is the sum of all that we have acquired, either through learning or experience. That when we talk about reading comprehension, there are specific types of knowledge that would be critical, right? Knowledge that are connected to skills, linguistic knowledge, for instance, right? But also that what we, what we need to bring forward is this background knowledge, which is specific to topic. And that the research, the science, individuals in the field have surfaced for us, have surfaced for us some general guiding principles, right? And when we begin to think about those general guiding principles, they lead us to the ABCs. They lead us to identifying specific tools, techniques, strategies that we can use. And once again, we need to be thinking about the adaptations that are necessary for the students that we work with. But I began with a very important question. And the question was this, right? I know we want all our readers to be able to read with meaning. I know we want all of our readers to be skilled. Paulo Scarborough says, that means what? to be able to both read the words and make meaning simultaneously in an automatic way. 
But why is that so important? Why is it so, so important for our students to become literate? And I want to leave you with this thought. We learn from what we read so we can do what? So that we can become uh, participants in our society. So we can become contributing citizens. So that we have access to all of the opportunities that one would want in order to have a successful life. So for me, comprehension is all about learning, but it's also about this ultimate goal that allows for us to be who we need to be as individuals. So gratitude, here's my email if you wanna communicate with me. I'm sorry I couldn't interact with each of you individually, um, but I'm always interested in learning from others, all right? And um, I enjoy cartoons uh, that say it all. So uh, here are these two little guys, birds, gals. <laughs> what are they saying? Uh-oh, here come the know-it-alls again, all right? Books, I want to be a know-it-all. I know you do too for the right reasons. Okay, so thanks so much. And now we have just a few moments to see if we can address any questions that were raised. And I'll stop the share. What a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, Nancy, for joining us today and giving us such a deep insight and deep dive on building background knowledge. I want to take a moment to say thank you to everyone that joined us today as well. And to drop any questions you have in the Q&A box or in the chat as you wrap up, we'll need to cover one or two um, as they come in. And just a reminder to everyone today, you'll be, you'll be receiving an email by the end of the week with a link to the recording and your certificate of attendance. And I also wanted to share, let me share my screen real quick. I also wanted to share our incredible knowledge building content bundle that includes an ebook, infographic and more. And you can download it, download it at amplify.com backslash knowledge dash building dash bundle. And let's go back into the chat and see if there's any questions that popped up in there or the Q&A. Looks like just a lot of appreciation for such a wonderful presentation today, Nancy. A lot of thank yous. Um, they just added the link to the Knowledge Building Bundle in the chat. So yeah, before we uh, conclude today, any final words, Nancy, that you'd like to share? Well, I, I'm hoping that um, what I've shared today allows for individuals to uh, revisit, rethink, um, and that um, this information will help them inform those decisions, important decisions that they're making every day. And I want to thank each and every one of them for taking the time today, because I, I know how busy educators are. I know how important your time is. And Amplify, you all rock. So thanks so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nancy, for today's presentation. We're so glad that you're able to join us and to conclude our webinar series. And thank you to everyone that else was able to join us live today. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.